Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to today's Director Special Colloquium on the future of computing. We're really happy to see uh, some of you in the audience who have braved the uh, elements to, to come today in person. I'm Linda Young, an Argonne Distinguished Fellow, Group Leader in the Chemical Sciences and Engineering Division, and Committee Chair for D the Director's Special Colloquium Series. I'm pleased to announce that this is Argonne's first hybrid colloquium. For the past year, we've had the Director's Special Colloquium only virtually. So it's really nice to see uh, people in person with a live audience and to have um, people attending online. Before we start, let me simply explain about how we'll manage the meeting for those attending virtually. Um, for the online audience, your video and audio were automatically turned off when you joined the meeting. Automated closed captioning is available uh, during our session. If you'd like to use this feature at the bottom of your screen, click on live transcript and choose one of the two viewing options. If you have difficulties re related to the technology, for example, if you can't hear the presenter or see the slide deck, click the chat uh, icon, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, send, send a message explaining the issue and one of the AV team will respond. To ask questions throughout the presentation, please also use the chat function. We'll address those questions as time allows. It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce lab director Paul Kearns. Dr. Kearns has been Argonne's director since 2017. He set the laboratory's strategic vision to deliver pivotal discoveries, pioneer pioneering leadership, and powerful scientific tools and facilities. Please, Director Kearns. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. It's great to be here, and, and I uh, want a second as well. It's wonderful we can host our first hybrid colloquium. Uh, certainly uh, want to welcome the people that are joining online, but also those, those present here. Uh, very exciting to see people in person and have conversation uh, firsthand. And today's uh, colloquium is focused on the future of computing, as Linda mentioned. I will start by saying Argon is dedicated to accelerating science and technology that drives U.S. prosperity and security. We do so in large part by designing and operating cutting-edge research facilities for the Department of Energy that have unmatched capabilities in discovery science, engineering research, and computing. One of the facilities that we are fortunate to steward on behalf of the Department of Energy's Office of Science is the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, or the ALCF, as we commonly call it. For years, the ALCF has helped empower the future of research with advancements in high-performance computing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And soon, the ALCF will be home to Aurora, one of the nation's first exascale supercomputers capable of per performing a billion, billion calculations per second with a peak speed in excess of two exaflops, sorry. And with this a vast increase in computing power, Argonne will work with its partners in industry, academia, and other national laboratories to predict the effects of climate change with remarkable resolution down to the level of neighborhoods, better understand the relationships uh, between the detailed neural structure of brains and their function. Uh, simulate better materials for longer lasting, faster charging batteries, and build artificial intelligence models that can accelerate a pharmaceutical development by predicting the structure of proteins and screening drugs that could target these proteins, those proteins. Aurora will also uh, make it possible to analyze large amounts of data from Argonne's other flagship scientific user facility, the Advanced Photon Source which as we know, uses intense X-ray beams uh, to allow researchers to study complex materials and systems. The uh, APS, the Argonne Photon Source, the Advanced Photon Source is also undergoing an upgrade to generate, an, an upgrade to generate X-ray beams up to 500 times brighter than those produced by the current machine. Individually, each of these facilities represents a massive leap forward in technology. Together, they will transform science enabling scientists to make discoveries at unprecedented speeds. With these capabilities, Argonne has the remarkable potential to advance the future of computing that will drive breakthroughs in research for clean energy, national security, and the life sciences. I'm eager to hear our keynote speaker and panelists today uh, share their visions on the future of computing and opportunities for Argonne to contribute to this transformative frontier for the next 50 years. To start this conversation, let me introduce uh, Sadasavan uh, Sankar, the Research Technology Manager at SLAC, uh, National Accelerator Laboratory, an adjunct professor at Stanford and Associate at Harvard University. Dr. Sankar 
was the first Margaret and Will Hurst visiting lecturer at Harvard University and the first computing scientist in residence at the Harvard Institute of Applied Computational Sciences. His research uh, includes some materials, chemistry and specialized AI methods uh, for complex problems in the physical and natural science, as well as new frameworks for studying computing uh, based uh, on uh, bio bioenergetics, thermodynamics, uh, complexity, and information theory. He is also the co-founder and chief scientist at Material Al Alchemy, which translates science into commercial products that use sustainable materials. After Dr. Sankar's address and a Q&A, we'll have a panel discussion with three other experts on the future of computing. We're honored to have with us today Salman Habib, I should say our very own Salman Habib of Argonne uh, University of Chicago and Northwestern University, Yan Jian Jing Li of the University of Chicago, and Feng Feng uh, Shaw of Argonne as well. Rick Stevens will serve as our moderator for our panel discussion. Rick is the Associate Laboratory Director for the Computing Environment and Life Sciences Directorate and leader of Argonne's Exascale Computing Initiative. He is also a professor of computer science at the University of Chicago and an Argonne Distinguished Fellow. Before Dr. Sankar speaks, I want to express our gratitude for all of the hard work of our colleagues and the strong support of you, the public, and our uh, sponsors. Your help. Your support helps Argonne accelerate the science and technology that drives U.S. prosperity and security. Together, we're unlocking frontiers in, tech, in science and technology and securing America's future. It's now my honor to welcome Dr. Uh, Saras uh, Sankar uh, to present at today's Director's Special Colloquium. Welcome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul, uh, and thanks to Argonne for organizing this event. I'm really honored to be here. Um, this, was, uh, this was an idea that was discussed long, four or five years back. Matt Terrell first suggested that. Rick Stevens, Paul Messina, and George Crabtree all picked that up. And thanks for making it happen. Thank you, Paul, for this opportunity. I'm really honored to be here and seeing you people uh, all in person to come in spite of the weather and the COVID. So with that said, uh, thanks to Matt also for coming in spite of the busy schedule. So I, I did not know how to start the talk given uh, what I actually had the talk figured out. Then I sat in a session with uh, Rick and he said, think 40 years, 50 years into the future and you know, uh, and I knew that there's no way I can do justice. But I thought maybe a better way to do that is to, originally I intended that I will actually do the puzzles and not give the answers and let it happen naturally in the panel. But then after discussions with uh, others, I thought let's also show what the future could look like. Uh, so with that said, I'm not going to go through this, but these are some of the puzzles that will lead into what computing should be. And I will touch upon this. So if you can move to the next slide. So this is actually the outline of the talk. I will address about three puzzles, uh, which all will kind of give us the directions to how it is. And then try to say what energy efficient computing is and why it is needed. Uh, you, will, you can see arguments from both sides. But then I will kind of end with a few concluding remarks. So without much ado, if you can go to the next slide. This is the first puzzle is from Richard Feynman, who gave it as part of his messenger lecture in 1964. He called computing physics in a stinky, tiny bit of space time. It is also there in his book called The Character of Physical Law. But they don't use the word stinky in the book. It's, so you have to actually listen to his talk, which I have a snippet of that. So if you go to the next slide and play the video. It always bothers me that in spite of all this local business, what goes on in a tiny, you know, no matter how tiny a region of space and no matter how tiny a region of time, according to the laws as we understand them today, takes a computing machine an infinite number of logical operations to figure out. Now, how can all that be going on in that tiny space? 
that why should it take an infinite amount of logic to figure out what one stinky tiny bit of space time is going to do? So let's kind of drill down into trying to formulate what does he mean by that by actually giving an example that many of you may identify. This is actually the COVID virus. Uh, one milliliter of sputum for an infected person contains about 10 million viral mRNAs, and there are about a billion to 10 billion RNA copies per person if they are infected. And the size of a single virion is like 100 nanometers. So that is actually the size of a single virion. And then one could have potentially a billion such copies in an infected person. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is actually, you can see a lot of these papers are very recent. So this is actually the pathway in which, to how this in, infection actually takes place. It's a very heavy interplay of chemistry, biology, and information processing. So these are the cell signaling axes that people are still in the process of finding out. Now, if you go to the next slide, please. The same thing, an attempt of this was made to simulate this, and that won the Gordon Bell Prize in uh, 2020, end of 2020. And this is the actual problem that was simulated. The same virus, they essentially simulated up to 305 million atoms, and that's what is given here. And it was done in summit machine, and with peak teraflop performance and about 305 million atoms, not the entire virion, but a fraction of it. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is actually taken the quotes from the paper. The simulation was run for 8.77 days on 80 P100 GPUs, and it generated 200 terabytes of data, and they used multi-step models, including AI, to extract that to simulate a single virus, okay? So if you go to the next slide, please. This is actually the hardware that was used. It's connected with 185 miles of fiber optic cables. The square footage of all the cabinets of the summit is larger than a commercial aircraft, and it occupies about two tennis courts. And then, even more importantly, if you click on the next slide, please. It took 13 megawatts. And people have actually estimated the energy for the virus. For a, this was for influenza virus. It takes less than 1% of a single eukaryotic cell to do the infection. So, it just does it at 10%, 1% of the budget a cell uses to process its metabolism. It is able to do the infection. And here you just saw how much computing power was used to simulate a fraction of this. This is actually the puzzle that Feynman was laying out. You can see the huge disparity between what actually nature does in terms of computation and what we do. Look, just look at the power disparity. There are 37 trillion cells estimated in a single human. So you can imagine what is the energy used per cell. We take about 110 watts total. So you can see how efficient the nature does its processing and how inefficient in our, even though we are at the leading edge in argon, it still is way in orders of magnitude. So if you move to the next slide, please. So the next is, this was a statement that Gordon Moore made in 2003 that no exponential is forever, but forever can be delayed. So computing has got us to, in 2020, to be able to simulate that virion particle you saw. So how many more such doublings are possible? There are many interpretations in literature many arguments about this, but I'm going to show you over multiple different perspectives of how many more doublings can we have. So if you can move, go to the next slide. This is taken, scaling roadmap taken from one of the companies, and they essentially have shown that there is a pathway to 20 angstroms, that's 0.2 nanometers. 
And in the, there's a footnote says that the graphic is for illustrative purpose only. So please read the footnote too, you know, before you totally buy into that, that there is a lot more to this. So now let's, if you can move to the next slide. This is actually the microprocessor doublings, actual data taken from products, 1990 to 2020, about 30 years. If you look at the first 20 years, 1990 to 2010, you essentially should have 1,024 doublings if you're doubling every two years. That's the number of the ideal doubling. If you look at the actual ratio of the transistors between the starting, between the final year and the starting year, you get about 975. So you are roughly following the Moore's law of doubling every two years. Now look at it from 2010 to 2020. You should have gotten 32 doublings, but you are getting only 13.68 doublings. So you are not doubling with the same pace now. Now if you, have, if you look from, for the 30 years, you are seeing that the exponential law is actually curving downwards. And in an exponential law, you know that it compounds. So if your doubling slows down, then it slows down even further and so on. The energy efficiency actually also slows down, which, you, which I will show towards the end of my presentation. So if you move to the next one. So this is looking at how much scaling headroom is there. This is a very simple calculation I did to give you an idea. Looking at it three different ways. The first is let us assume that we are looking at 10 nanometer today. How many more generations are there? If you go down all the way to hydrogen atomic diameter, we agree you cannot get there. You have 14 doublings beyond the 10 nanometer technology. However, more realistic would be silicon's van der Waal diameter, because that is when the properties are silicon material properties are changed. You essentially have nine doublings. But more realistically, you may have only five doublings because if you look at the number of atoms on the surface of silicon, as opposed to the bulk, the surface atoms increase are higher than the number of atoms in the bulk, which means it's no longer behaving like a silicon. If you put that as the end point, you essentially have only five doublings left. So no matter how you look at it, you have about five to 14 doublings. I mean, there's no magic to this number you would all reach around with this range. Now, if you move to the next slide, then we go to what is called the Leventhal's puzzle or paradox. In 1969, Cyrus Leventhal said that, how do proteins fold through this gigantic combinatorial thing? How are they able to sample a large space? So that is very much tied to Moore's law, as I will show in the next few slides. If you go to the next slide, Can you move to the next slide, please? So let us take 48, law, 48 years for Moore's law. That's 24 doublings. It's, it's 50 years now. But let's just take 48 as the basis. 50 means 25 doublings. So I put the number of doublings on the right-hand side. And then I put Moore's law as the basis. OK? So now, if you move to the next slide, if you look at all the length scales that are available in the systems that we are interested in, there are 27 doublings of length scales. This is a simple calculation, which means the Moore's law can solve, span the length scales. Now, as you go into time scales, next slide, please, you will actually see that you may have between 33, depending on chemistry or biology, you can have up to 40 doublings. So that just the Moore's law wouldn't get you to solve the problem. You need something more than that to be able to span the scale. Now, if you go into, next slide, please. If you look at the number of organic chemicals or the atoms in the device, if you want to simulate the entire device from first principles, you may need like 79 doublings. And the devices with four interfaces to make a transistor would be even, would be like 43 doublings. So then if you go to the next slide, the protein folding would need 158 doublings. So no matter how much Moore's law goes, 
you will still not be able to simulate all the combinatorial possibilities of protein folding by just the sheer hardware doubling. Something more needs to happen. But this is not the end of the story. If you go to the next slide. Can you play the movie? So before you play the movie, I just want to set it up that I'm going to show a ring which is circular symmetric a simple problem of dropping a ring on a drop of water. This is a fluid mechanics problem. And just the simulation of this dynamical system, we are not showing the simulation, we are actually showing the experiment. It's a very symmetric problem. There is a radial symmetry, there's the azimuthal symmetry, and there is a little bit of breaking of the radial symmetry because it's a ring. And then there is a little bit of breaking of the Z symmetry because of gravity. So it's a predominantly a symmetric problem. Dropping this should be very easy to simulate. Now I'll show you how the actual process takes place. If you can play the movie, please. So everything looks symmetric. Just keep looking how it ends. The whole, all the symmetry is broken down. And you can see that the water shape has, looks very different. It doesn't look like the starting at all. And this is a problem that is still harder to simulate. Turbulence in fluid flow is still an open problem. It's one of the clays uh, open problems of understanding that. So this is the point of that. Even if the Moore's law were to continue to solve these problems, you still have to cross, you have to do some other innovations. So if you can move to the next slide. So in order to address this, I just made the point that the actual virus for infection is able to do it at a much lower energy, orders of magnitude more energetically efficient than our ability to simulate it. That's what I showed it to you. So if you are going to address this, there is no way in you can do that by avoiding how nature works. And people have attempted this. Alan Turing has done this in 1948. And, and Norbert Wiener has attempted that. Von Neumann has done it. So I am just going to walk you through. In order to address this, the first thing we tried to do was to set up a computing framework that will put both the natural system and the man-made computing system on the same level so that then we can actually compare. And how to go about doing it is what I'm going to show in the next few slides. So if you can move to the next. So the premise of what I'm going to show is based on this statement, uh, which I am going to show now, that all information processing systems for an application, the application that you want to compute in this case is a virus affecting the cell. Next slide can be thought of as a combination of information processing in a hardware assembled as defined by the architecture using algorithms and software. If you buy into this premise, I mean, again, others have said this. There are, uh, there are multiple papers on DNA as, as a software and all that. So I'm, I'm just using some of the other things, but making it more precise here. You can actually logically express this as an expression. And this logical expression goes as this. Going from left to right, IP stands for information processing, is equivalent to an application, a logical operation with information, a logical operation with the hardware, and a logical operation with architecture. With the software and algorithms as gluons. This logical operation is borrowing what the computer scientists use something called P equal to NP. So if the information basis is the same as the application, so in a quantum chemistry, if you are using a qubit to compute, the information basis is same as the application, then it becomes an equivalent. If, it is, if you are using a digital basis to solve a quantum problem, then it becomes non-equivalent. So that's what the E and NE does. If you, you, if you just buy into these two, if you move to the next slide, 
Application, information basis, architecture, and hardware. I haven't changed anything. Next slide. The algorithms and software may be what are the techniques you are using, the error correction, the compilers. I'm just expanding it. I haven't said anything new at this point. Next slide, please. The same thing. I'm just restating the same thing. Equivalent and non-equivalent. Next slide, please. You can actually divide all computing, including natural system, into eight classes. Next slide, please. The, the class zero, where the application is different from the information basis, is different from architecture, from hardware, is the most general purpose computer that is out there. That is the von Neumann computing machines there. Class seven, no, not next slide, please. Uh, class seven, where the application is equivalent to information basis, equivalent to architecture, to hardware, is the natural system. So a virus would be a class seven, that's the eighth, and our computation of that is class zero. So what this has done is, suddenly it has given you a way of categorizing how all computing is. So you know what is on the von Neumann end, we do it every day, we know what's on the natural system. Turing had this classification in 1948. But it also opens up all possibilities of computing in the middle, as you will see in the next slide. So now if you take von Neumann and neuromorphic architecture, the von Neumann architecture is actually class zero, as I explained. And the neuromorphic architecture is class two. So you have found a layer in which the architecture is the same as the original application, but the hardware is different, and so is the informational basis. You are using digital basis. Uh, next slide, please. A simple example of this is if you were to take a temperature measurement of a thermometer, you can actually see that the information basis is analog. You use the application, the information, then the architecture and the hardware, they're all equivalent. So just a temperature measurement would be a class seven, unless it's a digital thermometer. This is the simplest example, but it kind of gives you an idea that you can actually use it to map computing. So this essentially set up the classification so this seemed like a nice way to end this work that I was involved in. So I wrote it up and sent it to review in the theoretical computer science uh, conference uh, anonymously. So three anonymous reviewers. So I, I sent this paper out. So these are theoretical computer scientists. So I was expecting to see they would pick up any any flaws or inconsistencies in the reasoning. That was the intent of sending it to them. And in the, conclu in the conclusion, we had put a couple of lines which said that this classification will help map out energy efficiencies of different computing systems. We hadn't done anything on energy efficiency. We just said that natural systems are most energetic. Von Neumann are the least energetic. So there must be an energy gradation and every system can be mapped into that. So we just put it as a speculation. But the reviewers caught on to that and said, unless that is brought in, this paper does not have a value. I don't know why we put in that line in the end in terms of saying that. So they actually, the theoretical computer scientists got back to us saying, please put specific examples because this, will, this is, they didn't find any logical inconsistencies in the formalism, but they said in order for it to be useful, you need to actually quantify that. So that, so that took the last six months to actually go about quantifying that, which I'm going to show you this. But in order to do that, I have to take you into thermodynamics. There is no way around it. Um, and information theory a little bit, and I will try to kind of keep it simple, but we can discuss it uh, in the panel or later. So going back to thermodynamics, remember though, 
if you talk to people in computing industry, they will say brain is very efficient. But if you talk to biologists, they will say brain is inefficient compared to other organs per unit mass. So depending on who you talk to, they say brain is either efficient or inefficient. Now, if you talk to the late, the more recent designs that are coming out in the market on microprocessor, they claim that they are already efficient as the brain. So not only do we need to go back to thermodynamics, you cannot avoid not looking at the brain if you want to look at energy efficiency. So then the next, I kind of put out what we estimated on the brain. So if you go to the next slide, this is actually the energy taken for switching of a single synapsis in the brain. This is a very simple calculation. Brain consumes about 14 watts. That's all the energy it consumes. You, and it takes 0.5 millisecond is its switching time. If you calculate that top down, you come up with a number between 8.75 and 10.5 attojoules. That is 10 to the power minus 18 joules per switching. Okay, it's, it's incredibly efficient. But then that is actually a top down calculation. You just take the total energy divided by the number of things and so on. But what we did was we actually used the ATP and the actual chemical analysis, and we did a bottom-up calculation that came to 0.77 attojoules. So it bounds with an order of 10. The brain actually spends less energy than a top-down estimate. Now if you compare with the microprocessor, next slide, the first number is the average of the six microprocessors introduced between 2020 and 21. It's actually three attojoules per switching per transistor. So you can actually see that it is quite within the range of the brain already. And the, the latest microprocessor from one of the vendors is actually 0.76 attojoules per switching per transistor. So now you would argue that we are there. So what, what, what else is there? I mean, the microprocessor looks like it's switching as efficiently as the brain. So is this the end of the story? but there's a lot more to the brain than just the switching, which I'm going to show you in one slide. If you go deep into this, this actually came up in the Carnegie Symposium that uh, Peter helped or Peter organized. The brain actually has large subthreshold voltage variations in a single synapsis. And the dendrites, so what is shown in the figure is connection between two neurons, okay? You can actually see these circular things being released, and most of them call them neurotransmitters. But they are not actually neurotransmitters, as I will explain in the next slide. What they are is, they are actually quantal vesicles. Each of them have 36,000 approximately, 30,000 molecules within them. So it encodes information within the information. So two levels. And, uh, then it releases it and the chemical, this vesicles diffuse, get to that and switch on specifically. There are 90 genes for neuromodulators. It's a very complex system to encode information, okay? So, so then we just said that the energy looks approximately same order of magnitude, but the brain is doing a lot more. So how do you actually capture that? So in order to capture that, what, what we did, if you go to the next slide, I have to go back to some definitions before I kind of explain this. The first two definitions are the definitions that is used in the computing area. Bits per second, how many bits are switched per second? Each of the transistor, they, have, they track all that. At the system level, it's called instructions per second. That's what the benchmarks are. So you actually have a bits per second. All the bits don't get converted to instructions. So there's a system level efficiency. That is where all the interconnects come in. System level efficiency comes in. Corresponding to this, we need something on the brain side. So 
what we defined was we actually took this from statistical physics, states per second, and states are defined as the specific configuration of the application. And then you have micro states, which are essentially the intermediate states that are essentially advancing to get that. So if you move to the next slide, then you define what is called a translational entropy. It is the logarithm of the ratio between two methods of information processing. If this translational entropy is the efficiency lost as you transfer information from one basis to the other, from the brain to the computer. I will kind of cut to the chase that you find that the brain has a translational entropy of about 11. It is 11 orders of magnitude more information is processed in the way it is encoded compared to a single bit switching. So even though the energy per bit is the same as energy per synapses switching, lot more information is encoded, 10 orders or 11 orders, in a single synapse switching because of the way it is done. And I will skip the details of this. This is just to have it consistently. If you go into the next slide. So on the left-hand side, the green is the bits per instructions, bits per second to states per second. Then you go from bits per second to micro states per second. It's that purplish blue color. Then you have the bits per second, and then you have the instructions per second. So what does this figure say? You take a neuron switching, and you are trying to do a computing equivalent. You are losing efficiency in information processing as you are switching the basis from a chemistry to a digital representation, and then when you're putting together a system. So how can we use it? Just give me a minute or two. Uh, I'm almost done. If you go to the next slide, remember I said that class zero is the neural network in a tensor processing unit. You can look at a neuronal network in the brain. It's actually, it should, yeah, it, this is correct. If you essentially use class zero and class seven, if you go to the next slide, please. Next slide. The energy between a neuronal network class seven is about 0.7 attojoules. Uh, the neural network is three attojoules. So they are very close on the energy. Now if you add the translational entropy axis, next slide, that completely separates. So that is what actually is happening, getting back to Feynman's puzzle. When you represent it in your digital computer, you are losing all the information that's processed in the natural system. That's what this is showing. If you move to the next slide. So I will conclude quickly. Uh, next slide, please. So this network, essentially, the framework that I showed you, classifies all the way from a Turing machine to physical systems. Information extraction is not free. I didn't show you this. It always comes at a cost, either in the architecture, or in the hardware, or in the software or algorithms, or in the energy requirement or heat generated. Whether it's quantum computing or AA-based formalisms, you are trading information complexity versus energy. That is the thing. Now, if you move on. This is actually Moore's law over, over, uh, from 1970 to 2020. It looks very nice. But if you go to the next slide, looking under the hood, you see that the frequency is more or less flat since 2000. So you are not increasing frequency. You are just adding more and more transistors. And that's where you get all your efficiency. Next slide. Why is energy a problem? This is actually a major problem for computing. The 10-year estimate of amount of information processed is going to be 10 to the power 24 bits per year. The energy to process bits could end up being 100 exajoules per year. If the basis is 10 femtojoule per bit because of communication, the total energy consumption that humans use this year is about 580 exajoules. So 20% of the energy could go into computing. And this is going to be a big problem. Next slide. 
So borrowing this from the real estate, the three most important items for future of computing would be energy for information processed, energy for manufacturing, I didn't even tell you. The EUV, for example, takes 100 kilowatts just to process pattern layers. So the energy for manufacturing is also going up gigantic. So this microprocessor, I showed you that with Moore's law going this much, you still don't get to solve the problems. And even if you solve the problems, you are solving them highly inefficiently. So that energy appears to be the single most problem. And I, I have a few people to thank. If you can jump through uh, one more slide. I, I'm just restating this, the last slide. So quite a few people have been, uh, I have been working with on and off, encouraging me to pursue this. And even at the Department of Energy, they are starting to get very much into this uh, energy efficiency as a thing. So that, with that, I will conclude. Sorry for running. Thanks, Otis, for that. There's uh, so many things that you raised, uh, and I'm sure people have uh, uh, some thoughts and questions about this. So let me um, start by trying to summarize what I think you were saying a little bit. Okay. So, I mean, this idea of mapping uh, between the physical basis of an application down through abstraction layers, essentially translations, right, right down to, to the hardware, um, is something that everybody who does computational science is quite familiar with, right? Because you have to uh, think in terms of some abstraction, um, and depending on the question you're asking, that abstraction is closer or further away from the physical basis of the right. problem that you're working right. on. Um, but as you pointed out, um, it's in fact the, the, the difference, or maybe the, the I don't know, the mapping or the gap in some sense between uh, the physical basis of the application and the hardware, um, that's where we're losing both information and we're also losing power efficiency or, right. or to give it right. Okay. So, so that raises a whole bunch of, of issues, right? So, so one issue is that, uh, you know, maybe in a, in a very simplistic sense is for what problems should we actually be trying to build physical systems to simulate them or to explore them rather than trying to build uh, computational abstractions that are just incredibly inefficient? That would be like one kind of question. Do you right. have a sense of, of that? That's, that's, of that's that? actually, um, uh, should I take this off and go to? Uh, uh, no, I think use the, the okay. lapels one. Okay. Yeah. They can, it's really hot up here, guys, uh, mic-wise, to really tone the. Okay, so um, an example I would say is, um, People are coming up with more and more innovative ways. To, the Moore's law slowing down has given a lot more opportunities for the incumbents. It's not a great situation, right? They were living on this geometrical scaling, and they are doing a good job. But the application people are not seeing the advantage that they were promised, and you probably know this even uh, very well. So one example, I tried to show two examples. The virus, clearly, we are not doing something right there. We are just gigantic power to solve a single very on. Yeah. I mean, that's a problem on one side. But on even on something as simple as fluid mechanics, we cannot still simulate turbulence unless you have gigantic computer and water is flowing turbulent everywhere. Nature is processing it. So, the one where it will be tremendously advantage, I will give two examples. One is quantum computing. 
where if you use quantum computing to solve a quantum chemistry problem just on the energy, but not on the reaction rate, because you need, to need, you need the transition state. For that, you need to come back into the classical world. So if you used quantum framing to do it, you have removed it from the application the other way. So that is one. The second, what people have been doing is what is called reservoir computing. They're actually trying to use the nonlinear feedback to solve complex problems. So that some specific problems they have found out, they have also tried to do it in optical architectures. They have done it in fluid architectures. So new forms of computing where you are solving the nonlinearity close to the application is, is being, just being intelligent about it. Okay, great. So what I want to do right now is uh, bring our panelists up. Um, so I guess we'll introduce them as they come up. So the first one is uh, Salman Habib. Salman, why don't you come up? So Salman is the director of Argonne's uh, Computational Science Division. Um, he's also an Argonne Distinguished Fellow and has a, a joint uh, position between uh, the Physical Sciences Directorate and, and the Cells Directorate. Now pick your favorite chair. Um, and, uh, and joint appointments with Chicago Northwestern, as Paul mentioned. And I ask everybody to tell us some fun facts. So Salman claims that even though he lives in Chicago, he manages to do rock climbing. So um, I didn't ask him which club or where, maybe he climbs outside of buildings, but that's a, a, fun, a fun fact. So Salman uh, is, is a panel, or one of our panelists. I want to invite uh, Yanjing Li to come up. Uh, Yanjing is an um, assistant professor of computer science uh, at the University of Chicago. And she's an expert in um, computer architecture. And I don't know a fun fact. Well, I'm sure there's lots of fun facts about Yanjing. But, um, uh, but she is here to represent uh, the computer architecture space. And, uh, in some sense, in, in Sadis' uh, nomenclature, Salman's kind of sitting on the application side, Yanjing sitting in the architecture space. And I want to invite uh, Fang Fang Jia up. So Fang Fang uh, is a, a computer scientist uh, here at Argonne uh, and a machine learning and AI expert in the data science and machine learning division. And Fang Fang has done a lot of work on neuromorphic computing and uh, is a pretty deep thinker quite deep thinker uh, about where AI is going. And uh, I think his perspective will help us and understand uh, some of these non-traditional models of computing, right? So we got applications, architecture, we got a hardware person, we got a brain and a person, okay? So you guys have listened to this talk and uh, I think Sadas' premise if, I, if I'm kind of you know, paraphrasing it, is that we've, we're really good at building von Neumann machines, and, and we're gonna keep doing that for a long time because they're incredibly useful. But of course, um, at some point, we'll have to build a Dyson sphere around the sun in order to power all of our computers, <laughs> right? Particularly if we keep doing something. Um, but clearly, there are problems where that approach is, is not maybe the most efficient way to do it, and particularly if we're trying to understand problems in biology or segments of physics or chemistry where there might be a way to short circuit that series of maps, we could have something much more efficient. And, mm -hmm. and of course, physical models of computing are, are kind of doing that by definition. But I want to start this by asking Salman, who works on, on computational cosmology. Uh, it's one of his uh, fun topics. I could also ask him about quantum computing, but I'm going to talk to him about cosmology for a second. So, so Salman, given the, the kind of framework that Sadis laid out, um, what would this mean towards solving ever more complex cosmology problems? Yeah, so I think so that's an interesting question. I think I'll give a more general answer, which is not just cosmology, but, but it also refers to the example you showed about solving an obvious topic. So I think one of the main points that I understood from this talk is this information mapping business, right? It's the information data. Which I think is actually very, very important because as Wigner said about the un unnatural efficiency in some sense of mathematics, which is essentially here. Oh, sorry, the mic is wrong. Yeah, no. The mic is very okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, this mic is very Okay. Is that right? 
No. Check. Okay. All right. Sorry. So let me start again. Sorry about that. So, um, so I think I was given a more general answer than the question that was asked about cosmology. Of course, cosmology is the most complex thing you can think of because every calculation is a cosmology calculation because <laughs> we're talking about the entire universe, right? <laughs> but, but the point is fundamentally is that you know we want to often be abstract problems, so we're interested in understanding as well as predicting. So if you say, take for example, the example that we had about the ring dropping in the water, if our only job was to see what happens, well, we could do experiments all the time and then we would be satisfied. We would never need to compute. But, we, but at the same time, we want to not just be able to do one experiment, but actually predict what might happen in another experiment without having to repeat the experiment. So at that level, we need to understand the abstraction and so on. And the question that I think of one of the big questions in the talk was this information mapping, which is you know, one of the big issues. So to me, the fundamental puzzle is, which is another way of calculating a Feynman puzzle, which I can write the equations in one line. I can write in all the sorts of equations. Okay. Sorry. Well, we can keep talking among ourselves while you sort that out. We're just going to have a good time up here. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just speak louder. And so, so I think the big question for me is that in some cases, the information mapping is pretty clear, like in the quantum example that you already mentioned. But what do we do about an obvious Stokes equation? Right? I mean, the, what we have right now is a very simple space time discretization, and that is clearly not working. Mm -hmm. so, so, I don't know. And Try this one. Okay. Hi. Yeah? Yes. Okay, great. So, so I think one of the big problems for I can see is how do we figure out how this mapping might work. And so one example might be that you know, we might be able to come up with something that are models of computation that are s complex enough that the information map is in there. And we may have to give up some of the detailed understanding. Like right now we do a lot of applied math to understand what our codes are actually doing. But you know, take for example the brain. Like I can certainly ask Rick some hard question, he can answer me, but I will have no idea how he actually got at the answer. Either right? would I. <laughs> okay. But in the case of a program, I can actually look and see, oh, that's how it you know got the result. So maybe we'll have to give up some of our scenario where we'll be doing complex systems with computing with black box black box modules that we will not fully understand. So I think I think that's so that what sounds, we probably have to give up. That's the, the interesting thing about that last point is that as we're starting to see broader use, creation and use of, H, of surrogates, AI surrogates, say deep neural network surrogates for classical physics simulations, it's kind of doing what you just suggested, right? So we give up some explanatory power maybe, we give up uh, some abstraction uh, capabilities or something, but we gain many orders of magnitude computational efficiency, which, which I think is quite interesting. So um, let me try to uh, move uh, over to Yanjing for a second about can, can, architecture. Can, I, can so, I just add yeah, a couple jump, of Yeah, jump in, especially if you disagree. If you <laughs> no, agree, no, that, no, that, you know, no. just... Uh, no, I, I just, uh, I, I wanted to add context to what someone said. I actually estimated the same translational entropy for fluid flow. It was an order of seven compared to a synapsis, which is an order of 11. So that's four orders of magnitude. And I did it for protein folding. It was like 16 or 17. So it's a very complex process. Information is being processed by the protein. So computing, the way we are doing, Feynman proposes in 64, 1964. We are 60 years into it. I don't think we quite answered it and even if we answered it, we don't know how to fix it. So, is, is, I'm just putting that out, not because we don't know how to do it, it just needs a lot more deliberation in how a new computing framework for that application or this application would come. 
Yeah, so let me ask you, I'm just going to jump in here, because one of the, the uh, opportunities slash challenges that we face right now is that we, we have the ability to make uh, systems with hundreds of billions of transistors, right? The, the PVC GPU that's going to go into Aurora has 100 billion transistors for each one, and we have 60,000 of them, right? But we don't have the ability to actually design a lot of architectures because the, the, the time and cost and abstractions to figure out what those architectures are and to validate them greatly exceeds the development cost of the, of the fabs and so forth. So could you comment on what you heard in terms of what this means for computer architecture and, and how architecture might be changed in the future? Yeah, so definitely there are a lot of design challenges and new applications are coming up every day. And then I think one of the, the most exciting things about working in the uh, computer architecture area is that we can draw connections from both the upper level of the system stack, which are the applications. And again, we have um, very interesting problems coming up like AI and new algorithms and, and so on. Uh, and we can also draw connections with the lower levels, like the physical representat uh, representation, new technologies, right? Not just uh, CMOS transistors, but also newer technologies that we have today. So it's both an interesting, I guess, opportunity, but also a challenge to sort of bridge these two sides of advances, right? And bridge them together to build uh, computer systems. And given that, you know, the uh, general purpose computing infrastructure that we know about exists for so long, and uh, I remember this is the same like architecture processor design I learned at school, and I still teach the same materials today. So for the most part, uh, when we're trying to understand how CPUs work and even some of the GPUs, those have been around for a long time. And I don't think there has been a lot of very revolutionary kind of changes for those architectures. And there's a reason for that, because we have developed good two chains, like compiler two chains. People are educated to understand and program and build those systems. Um, so any time that if we want to make a big change that is as competitive and as you know, usable as what we know of today, I think it, it's not going to be just a big jump, like we'll get there tomorrow, but we have to build on small steps, um, kind of looking at just uh, build on existing understanding and also evolving along with the application requirements and also the new advances from the technology side as well. So do you think that there's that we're going to see progress in, um, in, say, power efficiency coming from architecture primarily in the future, or is it going to come from something somewhere else? I do think that there will be um, places where we can uh, increase um, an energy efficiency. So one of the things, for example, is that you know if we look at the memory hierarchy, for example, right? We know caches, we know everything. We know that it helps us with performance, but it's also super inefficient from an energy uh, performance uh, stand, uh, um, standpoint. But um, this works for a long time because traditional applications have good locality, but we are increasingly seeing new applications where locality, uh, there might not be as many locality. So there's a way for innovation sort of in the memory hierarchy path. For example, we can design uh, different memory kind of reference patterns and um, uh, infrastructures for applications that do not accept locality, for example, and that will be one way of making the whole computing system much more efficiently um, and things like that. So by building a different architecture that departs from what we know of today, there will be, I guess, places to advance those. And then another prominent example would be specialized computing. So we know that if we use a general purpose computing system like a CPU, there are many overheads that goes into fetching the instruction, decoding them, all of those are overheads that are not directly solving the problem, but it's just what you need to give you the uh, generality that you need to solve all problems. So this increasing specialization towards, um, I, guess, I guess, offloading different specialized tasks would be another kind of interesting perspective of approaching this problem. Okay, great. So I want to get Fang Fang in the conversation. So one of the uh, you know recent uh, accomplishments of the computer science community has been to make headway on building neuromorphic uh, computational devices, um, you know, somewhat loosely inspired by neural systems, not always uh, uh, directly mapping them, but, um, but often the claims uh, from uh, groups building these systems is they achieve, you know, breakthroughs in power efficiency. Um, so the question for Fong Fong is, since you've played with a lot of these systems and you've been thinking about it, um, 
What do you see as the, as the trajectory for, for neuromorphic? I mean, in terms of the ecosystem of problems that it could address, and what are some of its ongoing challenges that we haven't really resolved yet, uh, that we would have to resolve in order for it to, to be kind of a first-class citizen in the computer you know, pantheon of, of solutions? Um, yes. To me, um, the most interesting thing about neuromorphic computing is it gives you a platform to explore different algorithms. So I'm interested uh, more in this aspect than the energy efficiency aspect. So um, one of the quotes I like about uh, uh, Moore's law is, Moore's law is not a law, it's a choice. It's a social compact between the industry and the rest of the world. So as long as we find uh, this uh, increase in computing power useful, we will find all kinds of ways to keep the trajectory going. So as Rick mentioned, uh, this uh, AI is becoming more universal. So it's uh, compensating for some of the slowdown in, um, in uh, Moore's law. So it's becoming surrogates for a lot of things. But the question is, um, when you look at the possibilities of future exponentials, where is that gonna come from? Um, some areas are slower, as the engine mentioned. There's a joke in compiler world that uh, the improvements in compilers doubles every 18 years. It's still exponential, but it's much slower. Um, what about uh, algorithms, right? So um, I like a study done by OpenAI this year. Um, this is something that's harder, much harder to quantify. They look at, at the image classification as a benchmark, and they noticed that uh, the number of flops it takes to train a neural network to AlexNet level accuracy doubles every 18, oh, 16 months. So that's faster than Moore's law. That's about uh, uh, 10 times faster given a decade. So, but the, the question is, are we gonna have incremental changes or are we gonna have um, uh, radically different algorithms? That's where I think a new morphic computing will help. So one of the, uh, just to add on to the puzzles that uh, um, Sadas gave, uh, um, one of the facts that uh, um, Jeff Hinton likes to cite is that uh, uh, we only live for three billion seconds, but we have uh, um, 10 to the 14 or 15 synapses. When you think about that uh, sequentially, so for every couple of seconds we live, we have uh, uh, a million synapses dedicated to that. That seems like a lot of memory for the pressure little experience. So then you start to wonder, um, it seems like uh, we are either under-stimulated or over-parameterized. What kind of algorithm is good for that? So and that's really open. I think uh, there are some intuitions, for example, we don't step into the same river twice, but we do ruminate over the experience. We look at the things we did in the past, play it out in our mind, and we anticipate things. There's a lot we can do to just reuse the data we have. That's uh, something AI is already starting to tap into in these self-supervised learning models. The other thing I think we can really learn by using these neuromorphic uh, models is to find different models. And people take for granted that deep is good. But when you think about how we do our processing, I recognize the faces here in half a second. When you think about how slow the biochemical reaction is in our brain, that's less than 100 steps, maybe 50. So even though it could be massively parallel, but it's uh, not a very deep algorithm. So that's the question I think we can try to figure out. So the new more can can I, yeah, can I say in, something? Yeah. Um, so, if you guys I, have some comments, just jump in. This so, is a... uh, this is, these are the numbers I'm quoting from literature on deep neural networks. The deep neural networks, or any of these image recognition, or any of these, they scale quadratically with the number of data points. One of the latest things that is hy being hyped about in the last few weeks is a trillion parameter natural language processing. So 
here are the numbers. It, to train one of those models, it takes the energy equivalent to four cars being driven a whole year just to train the model, including the manufacturing cost of the car. That is how much energy is spent in being training on this. So there is a real problem, right? Oh, I don't think it's a problem. Right? Really. I, think it's, I think considering this how is much... Assuming. Well, think, 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 use the same numbers about how much energy is going into Bitcoin, right? So the, the current yeah, yeah. estimate is maybe something like 5% of global energy production right, is right, going into right, Bitcoin. Right. At least these neural network models are useful, <laughs> right? So You think and, so, Rick? Yeah, well, I think they're useful. We're, we're certainly making Natural language them, processing but, models? But, yeah, okay. because they're not, just used, they're not just used for natural language processing. You can use right. them for distilling knowledge. You can use them for doing imaging right. and so forth. Right. So it's, I think, but I want to shift gears a little bit. So, um, you know, the, the gov governments around the world and, and VCs are putting a lot of money into quantum right now, quantum computing in particular. And based on what you were talking about, it's not clear to me that that's actually the right thing we should be doing. Right. Um, right. That we have lots of opportunities for alternative computing models and alternative architectures that could open up spaces that we know in principle can work because right. we have classical systems that can do this. So what should we be investing in to drive alternative computing models? So let me start with Salman, and we'll go around. Yeah. And so think of your answer. Uh, yeah. That's because batteries are being designed on old-fashioned computers. It comes down to energy efficiency. Okay, all right. So, yeah, so I think this is a really tricky question in, in terms of alternate computing models because fundamentally, I mean, from a science point of view, we are used to thinking in terms of math, right? And that's, and, and, and so, it's very hard for me to, to imagine something different. So let me give an example. So suppose you are in the business of, of, modern, of you know, modernizing railroads. So you can go from, from steam to diesel to electric. And you can say, OK, what more can I do? Well, actually, apparently not all that much, which is where we are stuck in computing. We are on a set of tracks, and we don't know how to get on. And I think in, in science, I mean, so a lot of stuff has been said here about AI, but I want to go back to more traditional computing. We are essentially trying to solve math problems. And we need a completely new way of thinking about that problem. Because the way we are on, what track we are on, isn't working. I mean, that's basically what I think the, the problem is. And so what we need to think about are alternative computing models for math. I mean, sometimes we can solve problems analytically, so that just shows the human brain can actually do something pretty serious computationally, right? Because we analytically solve something, so we know the answer to arbitrary decimals. In some sense, okay, I mean, we can't look at it. But but the fact is that there should be a, a, a computing model which isn't as brute force as the one we have. So I would definitely put a lot So you're looking for something that's less brute force, not necessarily more brute force. Yes, less brute force. So if, if we were going to solve, say we're going to come up with, I mean, I'll just pick on one of my favorite things to pick on, like, you know, say cellular automata or, or say Monte Carlo methods. That's not what you're thinking. You're thinking something in a... In I, I mean, if I knew what to think about, I yeah, would okay, say it right all away. Right. Okay, <laughs> I, all right, so, so Salman's <laughs> answer is new math and maybe new computing models that support the new math. So, Yanji, what's your, uh, what's your thoughts on Yeah, that? so if we have unlimited time, unlimited uh, budget, as a researcher, I'm really open-minded, so I want to see, you know, everybody's favorite, like, alternative computing paradigm to be investigated, right, and understood. But me personally, I feel like, as I mentioned before, you know, we know certain things really well, and there are, you know, a bunch of promising directions that we don't know a bunch of things about. So that would take a long time to investigate, including quantum computing. I think that's one of the examples. It has a lot of excitement, but then there are also a lot of challenges um, in terms of, you know, what kinds of problems can be solved, programmability, and other issues. So really what I want to see is, you know, I, I would uh, actually like to take things a little bit slower and really understand, you know, what are the limitations of the things that we know today, um, and then basically move towards refining that. Okay. All right. So move slower to go faster or something. Move slower to go it. faster. Okay, and it. in the process of doing so, we can also put our knowledge to immediate use, right? Okay. It's not something that will say, you know, we can only use it, you know, 
um, 50 years later, right? Even though we're working towards that direction. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. What's your alternative? Um, it's interesting. Um, Simon mentioned the uh, uh, last proof of force uh, solutions. That's uh, the opposite of uh, what Rich Sutton suggested uh, in the better lesson. He would uh, favor these uh, brute force algorithms like search and learning because they can ride the exponential wave better. That's, but that's very controversial, so I think it's interesting. My answer um, goes back to the earlier point uh, Sadas and Rick made, which is if we are throwing away um, efficiency in the information pro conversion process, why don't we stay with biological system for a bit longer before we figure out the hybrid systems? So there are this interesting field called uh, synthetic biological intelligence, and they are trying to do these uh, brain uh, computer interfaces, not in the neural link way, because it's still shrouded in uncertainty. But there are, there are this company called Cortical Labs. They grow these brain cells in a petri dish, and then they connect this to an Atari Pong game. And you can see that after just 10 minutes, these brain cells self-organize into neural networks, and they can learn to play the game. And to keep in mind, this is 10 minutes in real life. It's not a simulation time. So it's only dozens of games, just like how we pick up games. So this uh, data efficiency is enormous. And what I find, uh, Particularly fascinating about this is, in this experiment, there was no optimization goal. There's no loss function you have to tweak. The system, when connected in this closed loop fashion, will just learn in an embodied way. So that opens so many possibilities. You think about uh, all these uh, I mean, dishes, it's just consuming glucose. You can have them to learn latent representations, maybe to be used in digital models. So, I mean, although the brain cells are probably bored because they're that, just yeah, playing that, this game, it's not a I, the fancy I matrix. Say, if, you're, if, you're, if you're growing up in a petri dish and it's not very interesting life, and all of a sudden you get some input and you're going to play with it, right? It's kind of like <laughs> conjuring, you know, something out of a vacuum, right? And it doesn't surprise me that they learn anything, but it's, it's like, you know, uh, boredom is the greatest uh, driver for creativity in some sense. So, Sadas, I mean, you've, you've kind of spanned this whole space and you've been thinking about it for a long time. Right. And, you know, you use, uh, you know, the virus example because it's kind of timely. Um, I also noticed, by the way, all your puzzles are men. That's got to be changed, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I know, so I put a there. machine in there. You know, you got to put Grace Hopper quite... and Ada Lovelace. If you <laughs> you're right, something. you're right. But, um, you know, in terms of, of alternative things that could be invested in. Yes. So let's say you're king of the world for, I don't right. know, five minutes. Okay, so you have, <laughs> you know, pretty fast. Um, no time to do studies, no time to go slower. You're going to have to go faster to go faster here. So what do you think... You know, where, where, you, where, where would you place the bets? Okay, right? I, I, can, I can say this. Um, I, let me first answer it in the negative way, and then I'll come back to answering okay. it with a specific direction. Let us say if I am still at a company which sells microprocessors and want to continue this architecture. I mean, any architect would sell, including... Uh, people at Stanford would uh, agree to this, I think. The current continuation is slowing down Moore's law. Empirical data is showing its story, it's slowing. But the application space is exploding. Mm -hmm. Lot more things are being solved by computing. But given that the Moore's law, whether it continues to five generations or 14 generations beyond 10 nanometer, my point I wanted to make is it still doesn't solve any of the fundamental problems we set out to solve 60 years back. So if you are saying drug discovery, if you are saying you are going to solve digital human health or whatever, digital twin-based health, you cannot still solve the problem, even if everything is well on the computing side of the world, the regular side. So even if you get there, you are not solving the problem. But here is some, as Fan Fan said, nature is solving this. So I, flip, I would flip it and say, 
go where the application is exploding. So this is more for people uh, who think about it much more broader than I do, like probably Matt, you, and Peter, and others. The form of computing itself needs to go from application into the architecture. Right now, if you look at all the plots you see, application comes at the top. It starts with materials and atoms at the bottom. That is not the way nature is doing. Nature doesn't care. It, it solves the application in the most energy efficient way it could process information. If you don't address the basic gap, a gap of how to transfer that into computing, okay. Yeah. We wouldn't. And having said that, there are eight classes of computing, and we just looked at two or three. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of things we could do there without too much. If you go from class zero to neuromorphic to go towards nature, you can just open up all forms of computing. If you go from nature, as Fan Fan said, you can also open up. Each step would be a step. So. So in some sense, what you're laying out is, um, I don't want to say it's a blueprint because I don't think it's well enough resolved to be called a blueprint, but kind of a sketch of a blueprint of how right. one might do fundamental co-design that right. bridges between right. an application objective and the building blocks, the atoms or cells or whatever, you know, the universal building blocks that we have on the planet, you know, which are, could include other things in the middle, but so you know that uh, that idea, of course, has been discussed for a number of years, as you as you know, we've worked on it together. Um, but it's incredibly hard because um, you know it, it might be the case, like with the neurons in a dish, that because neurons actually are are co complex objects and they can do something, right? Whereas if I put a bunch of say argon atoms in a dish and wire them up to pong, they're not going to do anything, right? They're just going to sit there and be argon atoms. So, so one playful kind of model here, right, is we have these, we create building blocks that are able to compute something. They could be really simple gates. I mean, a lot of work in, in uh, you know, two terminal memory devices, you know, they can compute something, right? They can store their, they have a hysteresis cycle or something. But then you play with them until you figure out what they can actually do, right? This is kind of a bottoms up kind of approach. And, you, and I think, this ties into things like Ising models and where the physicists mm -hmm. have been for a long time, which is what's the simplest system that can compute something, right? But the kinds of applications that you're talking about, like digital twin of a human, well, I'm not sure I'm gonna spontaneously be able to make much progress on that by wiring neurons in a dish, right? I mean, that's a pretty <laughs> far up thing. It might be that some of these goals are just not reasonable, right? I mean, we have this, no, I mean, here's an example. So in the, in the case of protein folding, right, you, you, you had that as kind of like one of your top of the ladder, you know, complexity things. But we now know that in fact, we can almost fold proteins and in many cases get pretty good folds with much less complexity by using a different, you know, method, right? We're using right. neural networks and so on because they're, right. we're discarding most of the information That's exactly that is right. theoretically there, but not useful or not needed or, or whatever. And maybe right. reality in your ladder of complexity, maybe that, doesn't work, and I mean, it's maybe true, but it may not it's matter. Not needed. It not needed because maybe I, I, I maybe we all kind of live on a much lower dimensional manifold right. of complexity, so, so, right? Yeah. So that particular is is just showing one rough picture. Yeah. No, it's of, great. It's, yeah. Of configurational entropy or configurational possibilities way higher than time scales or length yep. scales yep. in nature. Yep. And nature uses that configurational entropy both as a positive force and a negative force. Positive means it can always adapt. The entire evolution works because the configurational entropy is gigantic on the biology. So that is an important aspect. But also, if you tie that to energy, then you actually get a realistic solution. And that is where I think time should be spent not just on the application at an abstraction level, Rick. One needs to move into actually quantifying what it takes to compute a piece of information. If you are 10 orders of magnitude compared to a single synapses, 
I didn't even tell you what other things it does. After the neurotransmitter goes into it, it is released, then there are, there are about 80 billion neurons. There are 80 billion glial cells in the brain. So the astrocytes take that, pump it back into the neuron it came from and reuse it. Sure. Do we do that to bits? No, but we could. Yeah, exactly. We could, yeah. So, so why, why not use those principles to design? That's something? right. I mean, it, it raises another kind of question that's more related to uh, some of the physics problems. You know, we, we do a lot of computing, but we rarely reuse computing results uh, to build on them, right? So when you do simulation campaigns and so on, they're all kind of in silos. and. Maybe humans gain a little bit of insight and they cross over, but we don't really mine, you know, what we've actually pre-computed to, to build. And I think nature actually is way more efficient in doing yes. that. It's always reusing yes. things. So, Leah, do we have any questions from the... It, the screen is not on, so I can't see it. Um, okay. There's a hierarchical organization for information and computation. This was mentioned as looking at answers from entities as black boxes. For example, the example was asking a uh, question to Rick, not knowing how he got the answer. Each level may use different compute paradigms. How do we account for this from the perspective of information theory? So, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. I mean, they're postulating that there's some hierarchy um, and I would say that nature has hierarchies, kind of, but most hierarchies are created by humans uh, in this <laughs> abstraction process. You know, we, we create hierarchies so it makes it easy to reason about things, but, um, but nature self-organizes and the hierarchies are often less clear. Like in biology, for example, you know, we have genes and gene products and complexes and pathways and so on. But even those, uh, nature cheats. Nature will bypass, it'll wire something that, you know, doesn't fit our simple notion of the abstraction to do something else. So, um, so at the same time, I mean, in this idea that maybe what matters is, is on, and this is kind of just continuing from the, from the point we made earlier, that while these problems may have huge dimensional complexity, the practical uh, operation or practical understanding of things happens at a much lower dimensional space. That's why math works. It's why uh, mm -hmm. you know, neural networks work. It's why humans can actually function and animals can function and so on. Um, so you know, given that, I think we probably need a, a revision of information theory or a revision of how we talk about these things that takes into account what we're learning about the unreasonable effectiveness of these methods, right? right. I mean, we, you know, humans are really good at getting things to work and mm -hmm. taking shortcuts and so on. And that seems to be exactly what nature does you right. know, all the time, right? right. So, um, so we need maybe a new theory, uh, a theory of shortcuts. The, the other thing to add to what you just said, Rick, the, the spike that goes along the neuron is converted into these quantal vesicles. So it is digital, but at this point it's behaving like classical vesicles. But within that pact is the quantum chemistry of the neurotransmitter. That is what does the reaction yeah, yeah. on the other end. So the fact is it changes the information basis as sure. it improvises along the way to make process the whole thing. So unless computing starts looking at it as a much more uh, adaptive and dynamic way in the architecture side, not the static architecture for five years, then you, you will always be on a slower trajectory as opposed to Could solving. be, but can you imagine how messy things would get if we, if we tell the designers, you can convert information to whatever you want at any point in anything that you're designing. It'd be like, you know, all of our devices will start being like biology, um, which is, uh, of course, lots of fun. Leah, do we have any more interesting questions from the audience? We only have a couple minutes left. And, uh, okay, so that's good. So let me uh, just go one more pass. You got uh, 10 words, Bong Fong. Summarize. 
um, what you think we accomplished today in, in 10 words or less. We opened the even more possibilities for the future of computing. Mm. Okay, I like that one. Salas? Um, energy efficiency is a key part to the future of computing if you really want to solve the real problems because that will take you on a more innovative path than the geometrical scaling. Okay, Salas? I think learning to let go is going to be really important. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I got challenged to build much better computer architectures. Okay, and uh, I learned how hard it is to run a hybrid meeting. So, um, uh, thanks everybody for coming, especially people that actually got here. We had a good time. Thanks, Sadas, for uh, coming out and giving a talk, and all of our Thank panelists. You. It was a uh, good fun. Thank you. And uh, some of us are going to go have a even funner lunch. So, uh, thank you. Thank you.